having had exposure to how MindTap um, worked, I began to think about how I could apply it uh, in a module that I'm responsible for, which runs for um, really all of the business school students who are not specialist economists and specialist lawyers. So typically about 600 students a year, variable levels of engagement, often having never studied economics before, and a group of students who I felt would benefit from being um, given a number of ways into the, the subject that complemented the materials we already had. I went for um, the Cengage MindTap um, option really for, for two reasons. First of all, I like the base material. It is the book that I had, had wanted to adopt um, and was my preferred source had been for, for several years, but I've been constrained in being able to resource that. Um, secondly, having been familiar with the way in which MindTap uh, worked, I liked its functions. Um, I saw the opportunity to have some interoperability, if you like, with my colleagues who were using uh, Cengage and MindTap on the, um, the BSc programme, 100, 150 students, and it seemed to me to be a, a, a sensible um, bit of resilience to make sure that we had um, a similar uh, resource being used, especially since it was one that was flexible, that I was familiar with, uh, and supported good content. So I like the flexibility. Um, I mean, in as we'll see, one way you can set up MindTap is to have a complete course available uh, for students simply to click through you know, by accessing um, Cengage as a platform. And some students do that. Other students learn in, different, in a variety of different ways. Um, and I think the last year or so has reminded us of the importance of being flexible in accommodating a variety of, of learning um, approaches and learning learning stimuli. So the opportunity that the Deep Links presented me with was to make individual resources available in a form that suggested a learning path for students who wanted to follow that through. There was a kind of stepping stones approach that they could follow, but equally um, students could dip in to individual resources as they prefer. So for example, a student that had studied the subject before might just use um, resources relating to particular aspects of the topic that were new to them, or maybe a, uh, an occasional progress test just to check that they did understand as much as they thought they understood. Um, and so that combination of um, um, an immersive complete solution coupled with the flexibility for students to dip in and dip out as their own preferences dictated um, was really what, what drove the decision. So obviously you mentioned about what you really found useful was the deep linking and the flexibility mm -hmm. uh, for the students. Are you able to sort of elaborate on that? Should we have a look at an example? That'd be great, thank you. Okay, so if you bear with me while I share my screen. So we're using Moodle. Um, and let me just make sure that I can share that screen. So yes, we've used Moodle for many years and um, it you know, has particular characteristics. Um, um, so what I'm showing you here uh, is an extract from a Moodle page. Essentially every student who is registered on the university um, is granted access to the, uh, the Moodle, Moodle page. And any student who has um, access to Moodle is able to access any of the resources that I'm showing you. So first of all, we've got a standard layout for the, for the week. Uh, in purple, our weekly introduction and tasks is basically what replaces what would have been a traditional lecture. So a series of short videos, um, a brief bit of context from me, and then the colleague who was actually um, responsible for the video lectures then providing a series of short bite-sized introductions to, well, we're looking at demand and supply here. And then we also provided the, um, the slides that we had used in the, um, um, in the presentations. Now, here's where we start to use deep linking. Um, I've identified individual elements in the, uh, the MindTap resources for that week. 
So I started by assuming that it would be good to get students to start off by listening to a two minute summary of the chapter. Okay, so that clicking here will take you straight, straight to that. Um, we've then got some brief videos. Uh, at this stage, we were using, uh, we, were, we were folding in uh, short videos from um, another um, another source which were which were compatible. So I guess there's a there's an opportunity. We're mixing you know a mind tap resource with another resource. Then the reading. Um, we decided that it would, it would be helpful to break the reading up into short sections rather than just giving them a chapter at a time, which can be intimidating to try and break up the process. So here's basically the flow. Here's a bit of sort of st stimulation to get get into the topic. Now do some now do some reading. And before you go on, a quick um, practice test. So we had set up a succession of short tests, which usually comprise no more than two or three questions selected from a much larger um, um, question bank that MindTap provides. And those are non-assessed. You can take them as many times as you like uh, to go through it. And the idea is that by having by working through those, you can check that you've understood what you should have just been reading about. Repeat the process again, because doing all of that in one go would be too much of a, a chunk. So no, another bite-sized uh, chunk on, uh, now we're looking at the demand side of, the, of, of our model, another short practice um, um, quiz. Um, and that's their, their work on what would replace a normal lecture that week. Of course, we then have a seminar and for the first six weeks of the current academic year, those were face to face. They, since then, they've been online. So we've got a fairly conventional set of materials um, for, for um, the seminar, which would pick up the topic covered in the previous week's uh, lectures. So these were questions drawn again from the book source. Um, and then once we've completed a complete cycle of, of seminars, we make the solutions available. And then finally, to try and get students to prepare for um, the following week, we'd included um, a lead on to um, an activity. In this case, it was going back over something that we regarded as particularly important, but very often we would have a link to a mini case study to sort of warm students up for the following week's um, seminar. So that's what they would see. Because I'm showing this in my role as instructor, you can also then see things that students can't see. So first of all, here's a bunch of resources that my colleague could draw on if he wanted to. Secondly, now the students can't see these, but these are the individual deep links that I've created in order to drive those um, multicolour sections that we've got up in, in Moodle. Um, so I've gone through the process of creating each of these as a, as a resource. Uh, they're hidden from the, um, the student and effectively that's what is triggered when the student clicks on one of, one of those. Brilliant, thank you. It just looks so neatly laid out and also we've seen that those where you do actually have deep links integrated into the learning management system is mm -hmm. we see students engage with it a lot more. So we conducted um, a, um, a review of, you know, inviting comments from students that had to be online this year um, at the, the, the mid-year point. We had very positive comments on the materials, on the um, step-by-step -step learning path so just to remind you that's this uh, this bit here so our idea of breaking up the um, the learning journey um, went down very well um, we had positive comments about the book um, and I think that's related to us breaking down the reading into short bite-sized chunks so I think one of the things that's this has drawn us into doing is um, to find a way of helping students avoid having to look at a finished diagram in a book, scratching their heads, trying to figure out which line went where and what order they build it, because there are so many other resources to see how these diagrams are built. By the time they see one in the book, they're kind of, kind of familiar with them. Um, 
So those were all the positive comments. The only negative comment that came back uh, was not to do with MindTap at all. It was to do with the way in which we provided um, our own lecture recordings um, to um, uh, replace the, um, the traditional lectures. And basically what students were saying was they wanted to see more of us doing the, the recordings. Uh, but the feedback on the, um, the MindTap material and the way in which it had been implemented was overwhelmingly positive. For those that are potentially looking at using MindTap for the first time, there is a lot of information and a lot of functionality that can mm -hmm. be done, and it can be quite overwhelming for people when they first yeah. look at MindTap. So yeah. is there any sort of tips that you would share for somebody who's using it for the yeah. first time? Yeah, um, yes. Um, so my first tip would be use the summer wisely. Um, it is definitely worth investing time um, preparing um, in advance. Uh, and um, I'll perhaps let me uh, move around this, this screen to show you how I went about the, uh, the process. So if we come up to um, here and I click on this Cengage link here, this is an alternative way that students can access the resources. But this takes us to the whole, um, if you like, you know, the whole the whole sideboard full of materials that we've broken down um, in those individual links before. So if I just click here. OK, so over here on the left hand side is basically the whole the entire course. Um, we could simply download the um, the entire set of resources from from MindTap, but we tweaked them. I'll show you that by clicking on the hiddens. Um, so let's go through here. Um, we can see that we used um, some resources uh, here, the first two chapters, but we didn't use the third chapter. We decided that that material was covered in another, another course. Um, so we worked through here and we set up our, um, which chapters we were going to use, which resources we were going to use. If I click on uh, this one here as an example, um, then you can see that some resources are taken out of, of use. So we've got the reading being used, but not in this case, the audio summary. When it comes to assessment, um, so I could have given students access to the entire set of 20 revision questions. I thought that was overwhelming. So we've taken those out and in, in a place, we've created um, progress tests short bite-sized ones to to work through which can be repeated decided not to use case studies there um, so i guess my first point is think about the course that you'll be delivering over the you know the following weeks or the, the year and set your course up um, you can make changes once you've done it um, but it's worth getting this course um, set up in its entirety before you start then building the links. Yeah. If I show you uh, what else we've done here, um, so a significant part of our assessment is based on uh, using online tests. And again, we set those up uh, to start off with. So here I've got all my eight online tests um, set up before the start of the year. I've vetted the questions. I've decided the topics to be covered. Um, all set up to be triggered automatically within um, uh, within the the MindTap um, resource, um, and you can see high levels of um, of usage subsequently. So I guess my first point is do all of that before you start thinking about um, setting up the material on uh, Moodle. Next tip. Um, I guess it's fairly obvious for, for any teacher or instructor, but think hard about your students. What kind of students are they? What do they know about the subject? Um, what proportion of your students will have studied this topic before? How will you accommodate the difference between those students who are coming to the subject new uh, and who will need a lot of support in the early stages in particular? And on the other hand, those students who have studied the subject before and who might trip into complacency, assuming that they, they know more than they actually do. So thinking about that led me into developing the stepping stones um, approach.
approach. And I think thirdly, particularly think about what we need to do to secure engagement in the particular environment we're going to be in. I assumed when preparing this year's work that we were never going to have a full face-to-face -face physical experience and that there was a good chance of the lockdowns that indeed have subsequently happened actually occurring. So I wanted to make sure I was resilient uh, to um, potentially a world of 100% online and I felt I could always pull back from that. I found it was easier to go from online to face-to-face than to go from face to face to online. Okay, well, um, as you can tell by looking at me, you know, I'm a, I'm a mature male. Um, I'm not good at reading the handbooks before I do things. And I'm a digital migrant rather than a digital native. So I was prone to a lot of the problems that um, might occur as someone who knows how to teach but doesn't know how to do IT adopts a publisher um, platform. From my experience, I would say, and I don't often say this about uh, instructional videos, the short videos that um, Sengage have produced to take you through the journey of producing this, really good. Um, they answer most of the questions. So starting with a blank sheet, scratching my head, thinking, how on earth am I gonna do this? Which was my situation last June, um, I found, that the suite of short instructional videos worked really well. Um, didn't answer all of my questions or I didn't get it all the first time. Um, so then selectively using the, the support from your colleague Roxanne, um, filled all the gaps. Um, and I guess, I guess two of the things I'd be looking for with, an, with a, um, a, a publisher platform uh, is first of all, um, good instructional videos. Secondly, knowing I've got good backup if I can't figure it out. And, and I got both of those from, um, from Sengage, can't fault the, um, the support. So I think that some of the techniques that we've developed here will continue to be used. We've seen real value in using uh, individual resources to prompt student engagement between seminars, um, to uh, find other ways of imparting information that uh, move beyond and perhaps in some respects are better than the traditional model of someone standing at the front of a large room with several hundred students um, sitting there listening on a rainy Wednesday morning at a particular time. Uh, we're seeing good levels of engagement with um, the resources that we provided. Not perfect, but generally the, um, the levels of engagement that I can track um, by looking at diagnostics are significantly better than in um, previous years. Uh, and I think as the year has gone on, we have, we've tended to consolidate more around the core MindTap resources. Uh, whereas initially we were kind of adding in um, other resources from other directions as, as well. Um, what we've tended to do is to focus back down on the core set of materials that's provided by MindTap and augment those with our own video recordings that essentially use those same materials again. Uh, the biggest benefit for me is being able to construct um, a step-by-step -step learning path. That I didn't know in advance whether that was going to work. I had a hunch it was what the situation required. The student feedback tells me that it, it was what was required and um, MindTap enabled me to get exactly that in place and it's paid significant dividends as we've gone on through the year. So, you know, looking at usage of some of these resources and seeing that typically 50% of students are reading the book um, online. This feels like we've achieved a step change in engagement and that's, you know, for me, that's gold dust. The biggest benefit I would say is in, in very general terms. Remember we're talking here about general um, business school students. I've got to be perfectly honest, for most of them, economics is not their favorite topic. So given that resistance to um, my topic, uh, you know, as a, as a subject area, um, finding ways of getting students into exploring it um, has, been, has been a real step forward. Um, this has worked far better 
than um, simply talking at students with a little bit of interaction in the big room once a week and then going through some some seminar activities to create a more interactive environment. I think we've got to a more interactive solution for students, despite the fact we're in an on online world. I think as we go forward, so I'm making the assumption that we're not gonna be back into large hall lectures next year. Um, I think our, um, our video um, lecture substitutes will continue to focus down more on students seeing us as instructors use the MindTap materials. So I can imagine building in more of that uh, into our, um, our own instructional um, videos perhaps showing students that we're using uh, an audio summary or um, a, um, um, a short video that explains the key concept as a kind of a breakout, a breakout point, perhaps just a kind of a taster to get to just to tantalize students, get them interested in what's available in, in the MindTap um, product. Um, I mean, really, who knows? Who knows where um, university education is is going um, long term? I guess the payoff for me is that I, I feel I've got here um, a platform that is sufficiently flexible that I can adapt it to whatever comes at us, um, whatever comes at us next. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. That's, that's already useful. So for really those people that are looking at potentially using MindTap, I think it's been really useful to hear your personal feedback about how it's come about and, and how it's benefited you as a lecturer, but also as a student. So thank you so much for your comments. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you.